Hello, everyone. My name is Wade Costley, and I'm the website information officer for my CP guide and a lived experience member here at Cerebral Palsy Australia. Welcome to today's webinar, which is CP Tech and the Seven Horizons of Possibility. If you wish to use closed captions in this webinar today, this feature is available in Microsoft Teams by selecting More, which is on the right-hand side of your toolbar, and then you drop down to Language and Speech, and then turn on Live Captions. This will enable captions for your specific session. If you'd like to ask a question, during today's webinar, you can do so by clicking again in your team's toolbar on the Q&A button and typing your question in the box that will appear on the right-hand side of your screen. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation today, and that will be monitored by Oliver Sweeney, who is our communications and engagement coordinator here at my CPA guide. Also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will appear later on the MindCB guide website. And before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar in Melbourne, which is located on the lands of the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all reside today and any Aboriginal <clears throat> and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I also pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their own cultures. So, today we're very excited to have Pete Horsley talk to us about CP Tech and its seven horizons of possibility, in which we'll be learning cutting edge insights into the world of assistive technology, AT, for people with cerebral palsy, CP. Exploring areas such as mobility, communication, accessible play, AI, and augmenting ability, and the future of assistive tech in the workplace. Pete is a founder of Remarkable, which is the global startup venture arm made possible by Cerebral Palsy Alliance and the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation. <clears throat> Pete is also a co-founder of the Inclusive Innovation Network, otherwise known as Plus N. He is dedicated to using technological innovation to create a more accessible, inclusive, and equitable world. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Pete Horsley. Take it away, Pete. Thanks so much, Wade. And, and hi, everyone. It's great to be with you. Um, and thanks to Cerebral Palsy Australia as well for this opportunity to share. Um, I do want this session to be as useful as possible. And so if you have questions, please feel free to kind of um, post them into the chat. Um, as Wade said, um, I want to make sure that I'm answering your questions kind of on the way through as well. Um, I will share screen and please just make sure, uh, give me the thumbs up when you can see that there. Excellent, that's fantastic. Um, 
I also want to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians. I'm on Camaraygo land um, uh, and um, pay my respects to uh, elders past and present uh, and also respect their continuing culture and the remarkable contribution that they make to uh, our lives. I also want to respect um, and pay acknowledgement to the disability advocates who have come before us um, to advance the rights of, of people with disability. Uh, we really do believe that they've paved the way for us and, and we carry both a, a privilege and also a responsibility because of the work that they have done. Um, and we look forward to creating a better, a better future together. Um, as, as Wade mentioned, we're made possible by Cerebral Palsy Alliance and Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation. Uh, and, uh, and we're a, an old organisation that's been around for a long period of time. But today I wanted to share a bit of a sliding doors moment that our organisation had um, a few years ago. And it really resulted in the way that we're now seeing uh, the role that technology can play in, in all of our futures. And it actually started with uh, this gentleman by the name of Alpa. Um, he lives in a small country town uh, called Bursa in Turkey. Uh, and, uh, and this came about during uh, us running World Cerebral Palsy Day. It was, it was an, an initiative that we helped to, to found with a num number of other CP organisations around the world. And when we first founded um, World CP Day, we didn't just want it to be a day for a day's sake. We wanted the day to actually kind of mean something throughout the whole rest of the year as well. And so we actually started it as an innovation exercise, um, asking people with CP, what's one thing that would change your world? And uh, so we heard from the disability, from the CP community all over the world on things that they thought would change their world. Alper actually said the thing that would change his world is if someone could create a solar powered wheelchair. We've, we soon found out that where Alpa could afford to live was quite a way out of town. And where all the jobs were, were of course in town. Uh, his chair, he did have a powered chair at the time, didn't hold enough charge to get him into town. They didn't have any wheelchair accessible vehicles. And really this the, the workplace was kind of shut off to him. Uh, Alpa also let us know that there was a temple on the other side of town that he wanted to worship in and, and he couldn't get there. So again, he was limited in, in what he was able to do. We then, uh, we weren't experts in making solar powered wheelchairs, so we put it out to the worldwide maker community and said, can someone make a solar powered wheelchair? We actually had a university in Virginia that, uh, that made a prototype, um, kind of built something. Um, it is to this day one of the ugliest prototypes I think I've ever seen. Uh, this was it. You can see there a few uh, a few kind of wires hanging down, but there's some solar panels, pretty rudimentary frame uh, that's kind of sitting there. But you know what? It worked. It, it took the power of the sun, it put it into a battery and it powered this wheelchair. Uh, we then gave some extra money to the university and said, can you ship this prototype over to Alpa? They said, of course. Um, and so uh, within days of Alpa receiving the wheelchair, he sent us these photos. And uh, for those that can see the photo on the right hand side, there's a white dome kind of poking out above uh, some trees there. And that's the temple that he wanted to worship in. Uh, six weeks later, we got another message from Alpa saying, I've got a part time job in town. Um, thank you. Uh, and so we saw that this was the power of technology transforming one person's life. And we asked ourselves, well, how do we do this, not just for one person, but how do we do this at scale for people with cerebral palsy and other disabilities? And so that was really kind of some of the birthplace of some of our thinking. We also started to think about the things that we knew. We knew that the, the rates for unemployment for people with disabilities was about twice as much as the able-bodied population. If you are someone who is also neurodiverse um, or autistic, that figure goes up to about eight times more likely to be unemployed. So there's a challenge there that we've got around accessibility within the workplace, around the right tools. Uh, to be able to access workplaces around the right attitudes and the right um, the right approaches to inclusion. We also at the time it was around about a billion, but now this figure sits at around about 2.5 billion people around the world who need one or more assistive devices 
not just as a nice to have, but as a need to have to access society to um, to be part of uh, kind of uh, things that are happening around them. And particularly as we think about um, not just our own context here in Australia, but as we start to think about the rest of the world um, and particularly countries where perhaps it's a lower income country, uh, that figure can be as low as 2%, as high as 10% get access to those assistive technologies. So again, we've got some challenges here around access to that, that technology. Certainly when we looked at, at a lot of assistive technologies that exist today, a lot of it was very expensive. A lot of it was quite monofunctional. It did just one job. Um, and it wasn't a great user experience as well. Um, we're looking at some of the kind of technologies and going like, how do, how could this be the best that we've got? And we wanted to try and kind of disrupt some of that to provide technology at a lower cost, at a better customer experience and a way that was accessible to more. But we also knew they're, they're kind of some of the maybe deficit kind of sides of things. We also started to kind of realize as well this rich history of the success that comes from disability first design. We unbeknowingly, and we learned this along the way, that disability had been quietly operating in the background as this major source of innovation. Um, of course, those of us who experience disability each day will tell you that we have to always be problem solving because we are existing in a world that wasn't built for us. And so um, innovation and disability are kind of hand in glove, like they are things that kind of sit together as, as something that is just by necessity. Um, and so if you look at things like the typewriter, um, which, you know, of course, every one of us probably at some point um, during most days are kind of sitting in front of this kind of QWERTY keyboard and, and punching out some things. That came from the experience of someone who's um, whose lover was starting to go blind. And so um, uh, Pellegrino Tari um, started to develop one of the earliest prototypes of a keyboard of a typewriter. Um, we think of audiobooks and podcasts, like they are a major part of, it's a major industry now. And yet these started for the blind community, allowing people to access literature and, and reading material um, through audiobooks. Uh, we think about even automatic opening doors. Again, these come from came from the experience of of wheelchair users who are trying to figure out ways that, uh, particularly for manual wheelchair users, they didn't have to turn a knob and try and navigate through doorways uh, with their manual wheelchair. And so, automatic opening doors were were kind of born from that experience. Uh, the phone. Um, uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell uh, had a father who was a teacher of the deaf, a mother who was profoundly deaf. He also had a partner who who had hearing impairment, and uh, and uh, he he became quite fascinated by sound and how sound could could kind of be be um, portable or more accessible. Uh, the internet, uh, Vint Cerf, known as one of the architects of the internet, was also developed profound deafness at about age 11 or 12 and was trying to figure out ways during university that it, he didn't have to even pick up the telephone to talk to some of his research colleagues and so developed some of the earliest internet protocols that are now some of the building blocks that the World Wide Web is built on. Uh, the learnings that we've had through um, users who, who use prosthetics around having to pick up delicate items like a glass or an egg, um, that is now being used in some of the biggest automation centers in places like um, Amazon and those sorts of things. And how do we, how do we safely kind of transport uh, some of these um, uh, picking and packing of, of materials? All of this, all of this came from the disability community. And so we want to try and recover that and say, uh, you know, there is a rich history here and there is a rich source of innovation in the disability community. And we knew that the, the future of technology had to focus on making tech for every human experience. When you think across disability, acquired disability, temporary disability through injury, through aging, all of these things really mean that it is not just for a segment of the population. This technology should be for everyone. It should be for every human experience. 
So um, Remarkable was kind of born out of this. We, we, we knew the experiences that we had kind of uh, working with Alpa and the uh, solar powered wheelchair. We started doing hackathons where we we're working with uh, the CP community and other disabilities as well about ideation and developing ideas to problems that, uh, that were being experienced. And so Remarkable is really about creating a world of opportunity, access and possibility, accelerating disability driven innovation and technology. And since we've began, and this is the theme that's kind of behind it, uh, this, these photos are uh, less than a week old. We just had the team together um, for the very first time, actually. Uh, they, we are a global team. We kind of have some of our, our team sitting in the States. Um, and it's the first time that we've actually been able to get the whole team together for since we we're about a team of three. So um, and and our strategy really is to support from idea or ideation right back at the kind of beginning, the conception of ideas all the way through to scale. How do we see the support that um, that some of these technologies need um, to even kind of uh, understand if there's a, a market for the solution that they're developing. How do we make sure that we do lots of great user testing and user feedback to ensure that the the uh, the solutions are actually built to meet the greatest number of, of needs? Um, how do we validate those things, validate the team and validate the um, the way that it's being communicated? Then how do we get it out to the market through commercialization? And then how do we begin to scale that technology? So over, over time, we've, we've worked with about 120 early stage companies or startups. Um, we've, diver we've invested in quite a diverse range of new technologies, um, right from robotic assistance all the way through to kind of 3D printing of orthoses. Uh, those have gone on to create um, lots of jobs, um, which we think is good for the economy. Um, it's also good for inclusive employment as well, as, as people are kind of connected to mission and thinking about ways that they can live out those values through um, the teams that they employ and hire. Um, they've gone on to serve about, um, now it's more than this number, but 186,000 customers. Uh, and uh, generated about $63 million in, in grants and capital being attracted to these companies. As Wade mentioned, we also um, have helped to establish a bit of a network around the world of other organisations helping to accelerate disability technology and assistive technology. So they exist across countries like Africa and India, China, New Zealand, Canada, US, uh, UK. Uh, and we're supporting each other as we're learning in this, in this, um, in in the way that we're going about this. Um, and really, what we're trying to do with uh, with this Plus N network is do three things. We wanted to connect uh, founders to what we call global market intelligence. What does that mean? It really means if if there is a solution that exists in a place like Australia. Could that potentially serve the needs of someone in, in Europe or in India or in Africa? And if so, how do we tap into what is the localized understanding of that market there to get that technology into the hands of people with CP or other disabilities in that location? Uh, so that, that kind of uh, is one of the reasons. The second reason was um, because we really wanted to see um, uh, investment putting to this space. We wanted to see the ways that investors could see that this technology could actually be um, something that is not just a space of charities and not-for-profits, but something that really is worth investing in. And then the third thing we really wanted to do is to connect and support the ecosystem supporters. So um, kind of programs or initiatives like ours, like Remarkable that sits inside Cerebral Palsy Alliance and Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation, that we wanted to see the ways that we could support them as they support all this other innovation coming to market. So all of that is kind of a little bit of a backdrop as to um, what we're starting to see as what we're calling the seven horizons of possibility. Uh, these are areas that as we've listened to the, the CP community, as we've listened to, um, to people with lived experience of disability, that they are areas that are in need of further development, are in, in need of kind of other innovation. As I said, when we looked at kind of some of the, the current um, technologies that are there, 
no doubt there are they have been transformative, um, you know, allowing people to have autonomy and independence, uh, to be able to participate um, and, and open up a world of opportunity. And yet it shouldn't stop there. When we see the amazing developments that are happening in technology today, we should be seeing that being harnessed um, for good in this space as well. And that's really what we wanted to do. So I'm briefly going to touch on these areas because I do want to kind of open up for um, for further um, questions or discussion. Um, but these seven horizons of possibility are just some of the areas. And I want to give an example in each of these horizons of some of the companies that we've worked with that are that are kind of at the forefront of some of this technology. So the seven areas are really around early intervention and also adult disability support. That is one area around inclusive play and recreation, around effective real-time communication, around self-directed and affordable mobility, around enabling education and employment, access to employment, uh, augmenting, um, augmenting ability and AI, um, the role that we're seeing of AI kind of playing in this space, and also smarter homes and more accessible and connected communities. So it's not comprehensive, but we're wanting to focus on these areas in the, in the intermediate term so that we're seeing some of these areas that perhaps haven't had the attention or the solutions, the, 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 the change that perhaps needs to take place in some of these um, that we would like to see. Um, and these will continue to morph and change as we go. Um, but really we're trying to kind of solve what we see as the greatest needs right now um, and and also kind of build some of our own um, in, in Australia and beyond, some of our own capacity to see innovation come to market. So let's dive in. Uh, so firstly, um, I'll go to um, one of the examples and there's a video playing here and I want you to pay attention to that kind of as, that, as I'm speaking. Um, but this space around self-directed mobility, obviously we know that mobility allows autonomy, um, decisionship in terms of where I go and what I do. Uh, and we have seen probably the main um, form of, of innovation that has happened in this space in the last 20 years has been the wheelchair, um, the powered wheelchair. Um, but they are still quite um, expensive and, and, and sometimes uh, they're getting bigger and heavier. Um, and sometimes don't allow access into places. We've seen the emergence of things like exoskeletons, but they are they are so expensive right now that they are only available to a very small number of people. We've been working with a company called Spinex uh, that are using um, uh, stimulation of the muscles and the spine to be able to look at particularly um, people with, uh, with CP um, around both um, uh, aiding bowel and sexual function, but also around movement as well, particularly in, in kids with CP. Um, and what this allows in the video that you just saw before was someone um, with cerebral palsy um, enabling a, a sit to stand movement. And what it does is it, um, it sits on a belt that sits around the waist of an individual um, and stimulates kind of some of the muscles. It then begins to train the, the brain about um, uh, using kind of brain plasticity to be able to enable movement. And eventually after kind of certain number of sessions, uh, this intervention has been shown to uh, improve aid, uh, improve bowel um, function and also sexual function. And also um, again, in kids with CP, we've seen it uh, impacting movement as well. Uh, so we've heard in the news that um, Elon Musk is putting uh, kind of implantables in people's heads. These are, this technology is sitting on the outside of humans. Second one around real-time communication. Um, some of us use uh, communication devices to be able to communicate, to give ourselves a voice. And so, um, uh, but some of those communication devices are still quite clunky, still quite expensive and monofunctional. Um, uh, the amount of, of hardware kit that goes into some of the communication devices that are worth tens of thousands of dollars, it's probably about $100 worth of hardware. Um, the main uh, kind of area around innovation that we've seen in that space in the last little while is to put it on an app and put it on an iPad. But we haven't seen that shift in, in, a, in a long period of time as well. And so what are the ways that we're seeing that shift? 
Uh, this company, Voiced, is out of Israel. Uh, we got to know them in 2018 when they came to one of our summits. And, uh, and they're utilizing um, AI, machine learning, um, and uh, understanding uh, someone with potentially dysarthric speech uh, to understand how they communicate certain words and it, it beginning to learn over time that when a person makes that sound, it means these words and that is then able to communicate in real time. So um, rather than selecting icons or selecting words on a screen, um, people are able to use their own natural uh, voice and it, it is able to then translate for them. Uh, around adult disability support, uh, we've been working with a company uh, called Ori. Um, we wanted to see ways that, um, that disability support is, is transformed not just at early intervention stage or early diagnosis stage, but all throughout the life journey as well. And this one is particularly focused on, on, um, on about the 30% of people with CP who utilise catheters. Um, and uh, at the moment, um, uh, a higher rate of, uh, of UTIs, urinary tract infections, is caused through uh, utilising um, disposable catheters. Um, this company is, is developing a, a methodology of being able to reuse catheters in a very safe way that reduces UTI infections by about 30%. In the spinal cord injury um, segment, that is uh, one of the leading causes of death um, is, is um, urinary tract infections or complications from UTIs. And so this company is using a, a way that's affordable. It's around about the same cost as disposable catheters. Um, and yet it's done in a much more safe, um, a much better way. It's better for the environment, better for the individual as well. In terms of early intervention, uh, we've been working with an amazing clinician, Brian Hoare, um, who is trying to um, figure out ways that we can make uh, therapy, particularly for early intervention, much more engaging, particularly for kids with CP. So CP Toys um, was birthed out of his own experience of of um, providing therapy interventions to kids with CP, particularly upper limb therapies, uh, and looking at ways that he could utilize um, toys off the shelf in a really creative way to kind of promote um, engaging therapy. And so he's found a way of creating ways of matching goals um, with toys and being able to do it in an environment that engages parents and engages kids in a really fun way. Uh, Polyspine was actually, when it comes to recreation and inclusive play, um, we see a few different things. We see, uh, particularly around the play space, that um, that children with significant disabilities are often passive watchers of play. And of course, we know through kind of child development that uh, that play is such an important part of learning, of growth, of knowledge. And so when um, children, particularly with, with uh, complex CP, are passive watchers of play, then they don't get the, the, um, the benefit of some of those outcomes until perhaps later on down the path. And so, um, so we want to see ways that we can kind of include kids um, in play. And, and Cerebral Palsy Alliance is doing a lot in that space um, around inclusive play as well. Uh, but this one is, is kind of more in the recreation space, and it was actually birthed out of um, the experience of one of the co-founders of Polyspine. Uh, his name's Riley Saban, um, lives up in Coffs Harbour in, in New South Wales. And, and um, Riley and his family were, were, were figuring out ways that Riley could participate in more things. Um, they as a family have this amazing kind of principle or kind of ways of approaching that if, if Riley as someone with CP can't participate, then the family doesn't do it. Um, but they were going like, Riley's got a, a real kind of desire to participate in as much as he possibly can. And you can see a photo here of him sitting on a stand up paddle board. Uh, so they developed a, a system that would give him um, as someone with CP, the support that he needed when he was out of his wheelchair. And so giving kind of um, upper body and, and also head support um, while he does a series or a range of activities. The photo on the right is of, um, of uh, someone who's a Paralympian uh, using the polyspine on a plane as well. So again, making sure that they're well supported while they're traveling to a competition. So uh, polyspine is out there and in the market. 
Uh, this one is you'll, you'll see a video that comes up around kind of some of the different ways that Cephable, a company, is, is providing greater opportunities for people to control devices at work. And so it uses a number of different kind of controls and you can tailor this to your own specific needs. So using uh, controls like tilting a device, um, it could also be around using facial expressions, opening your mouth, closing your mouth, raising your eyebrows, whatever that might be, smiling. Um, also around kind of head motion, so utilising the camera that is actually in a lot of devices these days to be able to tilt your head or move your head to be able to um, activate certain functions on a computer. Using virtual buttons, um, also switch control, which, which many of us uh, would be familiar with, and also voice controls. And again, this was birthed out of, um, of Alex's um, own lived experience of having a brother um, with, with, um, with uh, disability that um, him wanting to kind of ensure that he could participate in things like, um, like gaming, um, but also kind of thinking then this could open up opportunities for enterprises and enabling work as well. Um, a second uh, company that we've worked with in this space, uh, Focus Bear, have been focusing on in this overstimulated world that we're in with like multiple distractions coming our way, particularly for the um, neurodiverse population, those living with ADHD, um, that um, maintaining focus in that is, is a challenge. And so we see um, kind of potential um, uh, exclusion from the workplace around that, potential kind of challenges to mental health around that in the workplace. And so uh, this solution, Focus Bear, has been developed by a neurodiverse population for the neurodiverse uh, population and really trying to kind of look at um, productivity and, and um, distractions at work and how to develop good routines around uh, the support that they need uh, in the workplace. Uh, Focus Bear have been through a couple of our programs, our pre-accelerator program and also our accelerator program as well. I mentioned before that Elon Musk from uh, that's known kind of through um, uh, SpaceX and uh, Tesla, um, other companies, has also got another company uh, that's looking at implantables to, uh, to control uh, devices outside of the body using thought control. Um, this is sometimes called BCI or Brain Computer Interface. Uh, this particular company that we're working with through our pre-accelerator program is working on a, a technology that sits on the outside of the, of the body. So not having to have uh, kind of um, a surgery to be able to implant something, but instead utilising um, some of the technologies that's sitting, um, that can sit on the head, but utilise the, the power of thoughts um, for uh, inter interacting with a device, both for therapy purposes and, and um, potentially doing some therapy at home, um, but also kind of potentially BCI could open up uh, the ability to control devices and control other, other systems around you. Um, the kind of space around uh, smarter homes and kind of more accessible communities provides so much opportunity for independence and autonomy for um, for some in the disability community that um, that might not be able to at the moment control the environment around them uh, and instead they rely on carers or others to kind of um, support their needs around that uh, and yet when we think about the kind of smart home uh, systems some of that um, hasn't really taken into consideration the bespoke needs that someone from the disability community might need to be able to have a solution that works for them. And so this company Homeable actually started um, right back at the idea stage with, with Remarkable, uh, and we've helped uh, to really answer some of the problems that um, people with disability were facing around smart home technology. They have now developed a company that, um, that supports around co-design of smart home solutions for individuals. They also can support the installation of those um, smart home technologies and then education about how to use that technology as well. Um, really trying to make sure that at the centre of this is a really great um, customer experience um, um, bespoke to the needs of, of someone with CP or other disabilities. So these are all uh, kind of some of the technologies and some of the horizons that we see. I'm sure that many on this call right now will um, have other areas that they'd love for us to focus on or think that we've perhaps missed 
Um, and we'd love to kind of hear from you about some of those. Um, but I want to leave you with just um, uh, three things and then a final thought before we go to questions. Um, and the first of these, I think, is kind of um, really the role that you've all got to play in amongst this. Um, the take home I want that you to have is to really understand that, um, you know, when we promote disability inclusion, um, we are giving uh, voice to the fact that that disability and CP have been a quiet innovation revolution that's been happening in the background. And we need to continue to keep pushing this space. We need to keep pushing um, and solving the problems in this space. And how do we do that? We do that by listening to our customers, our clients, to listen to each other, um, those of us with lived experience of disability. Uh, and we want to hear from you. So Remarkable CPA, CPA um, Alliance Research Foundation wants to hear from you as well. Uh, so if you have lived experience of disability, we want to hear some of the challenges that you're facing, some of the things that you don't think there are good solutions for. And we want to see that continuing to, to create um, this innovation revolution. Secondly, we think that as we as we progress into this space, that this is actually going to create a seismic shift in the way that we, we look at hiring, inclusive hiring. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion at the moment, um, but uh, not a lot of, of um, en energy and effort is being put into well, what does this mean for the supports that are required within workplaces? How do we ensure that when we're providing employment opportunities for people with CP and other disabilities, that it isn't just kind of a base level job, but that there's opportunities um, from the C-suite all the way down. Uh, and when we start to get some of these tools and supports in the right place, in the right way, we will see a seismic shift in the way that uh, employment opens up for, for people with CP and other disabilities as well. And we saw this through um, COVID. <laughs> When we saw that the world kind of temporarily closed, we, we saw a world that was disabled. And, and, you know, things that the disability community have been pushing for for years around, uh, you know, supporting uh, working from home and in places where, where someone with, with CP and other disabilities have the right supports in place, all of a sudden it was kind of made available to them um, through um, this thing that they've been pushing for and, and asking for for decades was all of a sudden made available to them. And we saw the way that that kind of opened up um, employment opportunities. So we're, we're going to continue to see that um, shifting as we see more of these supports, more of these um, available um, uh, bespoke accommodations for people with, with uh, cerebral palsy and other disabilities. And related to that, we this kind of area around AI is going to be one of the greatest um, tools and greatest points of leverage that I think we can have. We all love the way that, um, you know, we can watch Netflix and it suggests things that are kind of, you know, things that I would like to watch. Um, that is just kind of scraping on the on the edge of of machine learning to understand a person's individual needs or the way that Spotify suggests music to us. What we're going to see in the next few years is the way that AI will have a really, really powerful influence on the way that um, that uh, technology is able to understand the individual and the individual environment and for it to adapt to that person's individual needs in the moment. And so this again will be a it will create a seismic shift across uh, the way that um, that we think about AI. And we really believe that if you focus on it from the disability space, um, that AI is then embedded with empathy, which we're seeing at the moment is a real challenge. It's built on the experiences of kind of some kind of middle 50th percentile kind of so-called normal um, white male from a very white kind of um, country. So uh, it needs to open up and expand. And that's when we'll start to see that kind of really take power. So I said I'd leave you with one last point before we go to, um, to questions. Um, and you might be asking, what does this all have to do with you? And I think each of each of us on this call, whether we're a clinician, whether we're from a disability service provider, where we're, whether we're someone with CP or another disability, have a role to play in this. 
And if we think, oh, we're just one small kind of cog in the in the wheel of things, then um, I love this quote from the Dalai Lama that says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Um, so I'll leave it there and kind of open up for um, for some questions. Thanks so much, Pete, for that excellent, very interesting presentation. Um, we don't currently have any questions submitted in the q and I'll just remind uh, attendees and give you a couple of very quick moments. If you would like to submit a question, if you could do it as a typed question in that Q&A area. And I'll just quickly take this opportunity to uh, say that this is one of a series of webinars that my CP Guide is doing to engage with people in the disability sector, but also anyone who would be a user of my CP Guide. If you're not familiar with what my CP Guide is and what it does, Effectively, it is a website and its core purpose is to serve as an information hub covering a real breadth of topics relating to CP, managing the condition and other aspects of a person's lifestyle, such as work and education and so on. And so it really has in common with Remarkable the fact that our ambition is to empower people to uh, have more choices in life. And uh, for us, it is through the mode of uh, people having more information and being better informed about a variety of topics. So I really encourage you to check out my CP guide if you're not already acquainted with it and to subscribe to our newsletter so you can be informed when we have other webinars coming up soon. You can simply go to the homepage of mycpguide.org.au and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up there. So I believe that we don't have any questions from attendees. So again, I'll say thank you very much, Pete. And I believe that we will wrap it up there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you very much, Pete. It was a great presentation. And it just shows that um, you know, the huge benefit that uh, technology provides, you know, not only to people with disabilities, but to the you know, the whole global population at large. And, uh, you know, from a disability point of view, you know, it encourages or increases inclusion and engagement. And, you know, that's a win-win for everyone. So uh, we really appreciate your presentation. It was great to see all of those innovations. And uh, I'm sure there will be even more exciting innovation in the future as well. So thank you, Pete. Thanks, Wade. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining. And just a reminder, this, uh, the recording of this will be made available on the MyCP Guide website. So thanks again for everyone attending, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Cheers. Have a good day.